Today's topic is boundary value problems. And while this material might seem rather abstract, it turns out to be very important in order for us to understand the nature of and the use of the various solutions to Maxwell's equations that we're going to derive throughout this course. Kind of at issue is that Maxwell's equations are partial differential equations. So they involve things like, say, the x derivative of the y component of the electric field, maybe also the z component of the uh, the z derivative of the z component of the magnetic field, and etc. and so on. So we have these partial derivatives with the various coordinates and possibly different field components. And suppose we're trying to solve for one of those field components. Let's just call it E. And we're in a particular coordinate system with coordinates U, V, and W. Those could be X, Y, Z. And rectangular coordinates are R, theta, phi in spherical coordinates. And we're faced with a partial differential equation. Partial differential equations are notoriously difficult to solve. And our only systematic way to solve this uh, will be to try to uh, achieve a so-called separation of variables, where hopefully this breaks up into a single ordinary differential equation in the coordinate u, a separate single ordinary differential equation in the coordinate v, and a separate single ordinary differential equation in the coordinate w. Now, in our lecture on ordinary differential equations, we developed and reviewed some fairly powerful, fairly general methods for solving ordinary differential equations. So that we can do. So this is really about the only systematic way we have to try to attack solutions of Maxwell's equations. And what that's going to look like, what's going to be required for that to happen, is that we must be able to break up E of u, v, and w into a factored form, f of u, g of v, h of w. Now that's a very specific form. And if we are able to achieve that and define solutions in this factored form, that'll be great. We'll have some solutions to Maxwell's equations. But here's the issue. Those are only a small subset of an infinite family of all possible solutions of Maxwell's equations, every possible electromagnetic field that can exist in nature. So if we only have a few very specific solutions that have this form, how can we get at or, or express other types of more complicated solutions that don't have that factored form? And the answer comes to us from Sturm Liouville theory. And this is closely related to the idea of Fourier series that you already know about from your undergraduate work. A kind of similar uh, an analogy to this kind of process would be, well, suppose we know how to form sines and cosines, and that's all we know how to make. And then somebody says, well, I want to make some arbitrary function. Well, we actually know that we can build an arbitrary function as a linear superposition of sines and cosines as, as a Fourier series. So this is going to be kind of similar. We're going to be able to use these factored solutions to build, based on this, these ideas from sturm liouville theory, um, an arbitrary solution to Maxwell's equations. Right? So this is the key. We're only going to be able to find a certain family of solutions, but we'll find that that family of solutions can be used to represent an arbitrary solution to Maxwell's equations. Suppose 
we have a differential equation. Y double prime plus omega squared Y is equal to zero. And we have initial conditions, maybe of the form Y at zero is equal to zero, Y prime at zero is equal to one. Well, we know from our lecture on ordinary differential equations that this system has a unique solution, and it will for any initial conditions I can give it. If it's a second order equation, I need two initial conditions, third order, I need three, etc. cetera. Um, so in this case, it would be something along the lines of here's x, and here's x equals zero, and our initial condition is that the function is zero there, but the slope is one. And we know that the differential equation then, certainly numerically, just gives us a formula to plug and chug in and get future values, or let's call them values for greater values of x, and give us y as a function of x. Now, another way we could specify solutions to this differential equation would be to specify boundary conditions. And in fact, in electromagnetics, this is usually the type of method we use. That might have a form of, say, y at 0 is equal to 0, and let's say maybe y at 1 is equal to 0. So this would be the case where here's the x-axis, here's 0, and over here is 1, and we want the function to be 0 at x equals 0, and 0 at x equals 1. Now, a trivial solution in that case would just be y is identically equal to 0, but we want non-trivial solutions to this. Well, this is a little more tricky. There may not be solutions, or there may be solutions only for certain values of this parameter in the equation. Okay, so let's take a look at that. What is the solution of y double prime plus omega squared y? Well, it would be of the form y is equal to a cosine omega x plus b sine omega x. That's the general solution of this equation. And if we want y of 0 to be equal to 0, well, just plug that in. y of 0 is, well, sine of 0 is 0. That's okay. Cosine of 0 is 1, and then you'd have a. So y of 0 is equal to a. That's got to be equal to 0. So a is equal to 0. We only have the sine part then. Okay, so we're left with y is b sine omega x. Now, our second condition is that y at 1 is equal to 0. Well, let's see, that would be sine of omega times 1. Sine of omega times b is equal to 0. We don't want to take b is equal to 0 because that just gives us that y is identically 0. That's the trivial solution. So instead, we've got to have sine of omega is equal to 0. Omega x, x is 1 in this case. So sine of omega is equal to 0. Well, that's only true for certain values of omega. And what are those values? Well, they would be the integer values k times pi. Sine of pi, sine of 0, sine of 2 pi, etc. So, if that's true then, for example, for k equals 1, we would get this one bump solution. For k equals 2, we could get this two bump solution, k equals 3, and that's not a very good, very symmetric, but you get the idea, I think. Uh, so for various values of this parameter k, let's call that omega k, we can get solutions. And we'll have an infinite family of solutions. And they'll all be sine waves. But now let's take a superposition of those solutions. y of x is the sum, say n equals 1 to infinity, b sub n sine of n pi x. Now each one of these is a sign that has this property that uh, omega is an integer multiple of pi, so it will be a solution of this boundary condition problem. 
The superposition of all those different solutions, though, is a form of a Fourier series. And in fact, this can represent, as we know, Fourier series can represent an arbitrary function over their uh, period. And in this case, it would be an arbitrary function that satisfies these boundary conditions, that the, the function is 0 at x equals 0 and 0 at x equals 1. So this now would represent an arbitrary function that meets the boundary conditions. And yet our original equation only had sinusoidal solutions. That's kind of the flavor of sturm liouville theory and the way we will apply it. We'll get these very specific equations, we'll solve them, but we'll get these families of solutions based on various values of a parameter in the equation that lead to us being able to solve the boundary value problem. And then we'll be able to use a superposition of those functions to represent arbitrary functions. In fact, arbitrary solutions we'll see to Maxwell's equations that match those boundary conditions. Now consider the following differential equation. u of x times y prime, and then that product, prime, derivative of that product, plus lambda w of x plus v of x times y is equal to zero. That's an ordinary differential equation. It's linear in y and y prime and indeed in y double prime because when you take the derivative here, you're, you're gonna get a y double prime from the derivative of this product. It's kind of a strange form of a differential equation where we'll see the advantage of this and in fact the generality of it in a moment. And we wanna solve this over some interval, x1 less than or equal to x less than or equal to x2. And we're gonna solve it subject to some boundary conditions, so-called homogeneous boundary conditions. Homogeneous meaning, in this case, that something's equal to zero at those boundaries. At the left boundary, we're gonna have a1 y at, of x1 plus b1 y prime at x1 is equal to zero. So some arbitrary linear combination of the function and its derivative at point x1 is equal to zero, or, will also allow for u at x1 is equal to zero. That's an alternate boundary condition there. This form, of course, we could take a1 equal to one and b1 equal to zero. That would just require that the function vanish at x1. Or we could take b1 equal to one and a1 equal to zero. That would require that the derivative vanish at that point. Or a linear combination would be some combination of the function and its derivative has the vanish. So quite general boundary conditions. And at the second point, other end point, x2, we'll have a2 y of x2 plus b2 y prime of x2 is equal to zero, or we'll also accept u of x2 is equal to zero. Okay, so that's called the Sturm Liouville problem after the two uh, mathematicians who studied it. Let's put this in a little more, uh, let's say, familiar form by actually doing the derivatives here. So, and I'm going to, now when I write w and u, etc., I'm going to drop the of x just for compactness. So, on the first one, we're taking the derivative of a product, so we have the first times the derivative of the second plus the derivative of the first times the second. And then we have plus lambda w plus v times y is equal to zero. And this is starting to look a little more familiar. Here's the second derivative, first derivative, and zeroth derivative term. Let's divide by u, and then we would have y double prime plus u prime over u, y prime, plus lambda w plus v over u times y is equal to zero. 
And now this explicitly has the form y double prime plus p of x y prime plus q of x y is equal to zero. It's a second order linear and homogeneous differential equation. And we identify that our, our p of x is u prime of x over u of x, and our q of x is this term here, lambda w of x plus v of x over u of x. So obviously we can put this term Liouville differential equation in the form, a little more standard form of a second order ordinary differential equation. If we want to go the other way, suppose we have an equation in this form, we have got a p of x and a q of x, can we put it in the sturm liouville form? Well, this first equation relates u prime and u to p of x, and that actually has the solution u of x is equal to u at zero e to the integral from zero to x p of s ds. You can just verify by substitution that that then satisfies um, this equation. So you give me a p, and I can give you the u. And then, as far as um, getting the, the v and the w and the lambda, well, I've got lots of different ways I can do that. Then we just need to say lambda w of x plus v of x is equal to q of x times this u of x that we just solved for. So known stuff over on the right, and there would be lots of different ways I could arrange the left. I could just get rid of the lambda term and just say this is our my v of x. Of course, we'll see that the, the lambda parameter, right, lambda here is just the parameter, that's going to be kind of where the magic happens, and so this will be particularly useful for equations where this breaks up into two parts and one of them has is multiplied by some variable parameter lambda but lots of ways we could do that so we can also take a regular old second order homogeneous differential equation and then cast it in the form of this term liouville so there's no loss of generality it's just that this particular form we'll see is quite convenient for the de developing the theory Here's an equation that we'll come across in spherical coordinates. It's called the Legendre equation. y double prime minus 2x over 1 minus x squared y prime plus n times n plus 1 over 1 minus x squared times y is equal to 0 to be solved over the interval minus 1, less than or equal to x, less than or equal to 1. So, let's see. Uh, the p term here, the coefficient of y prime, actually that already has the form that if we call the denominator 1 minus x squared is equal to u, then u prime would be minus 2x. So that, we can just by inspection see that has the form of plus u prime over u. And then the q here, well, that's already got the 1 over u there. So we're going to then have n times n plus 1 over 1 minus x squared is equal to lambda w plus v over u. And this is, this is the u there. So a pretty obvious thing we could do there is just say that, well, v is equal to 0 and w is equal to 1, and then the right-hand side is just lambda, and lambda is this parameter, which we're calling n times n plus 1. So that's one of the ways we could then convert this equation into the sturm liouville form, and then it would look like this. u, which is 1 minus x squared, times y prime, the product prime, plus lambda w, which is just n times n plus 1, 
plus u, which is plus 0, times y is equal to 0. And that would be the sturm liouville form of that equation there. Let's rearrange the sturm liouville equation to have the form uy prime, product prime, and then the next term we're going to break up. We're going to leave the vy term on the left and move the lambda term to the right. So we have minus lambda wy on the right. Now remember we're trying to solve this over the interval of x from x1 to x2. And lambda is a parameter that we can adjust in order to get solutions. Suppose when we set lambda equal to lambda m, we get the solution ym of x. And when we set lambda equal to lambda n, we get the solution yn of x. We call these lambda values eigenvalues of the problem. And the corresponding solutions we call eigenfunctions. Eigen is a, I think it's a Dutch term that, that means proper or characteristic, the characteristic values of this equation. So let's write out the sturm liouville equation for these two solutions. In the first case, we get u, ym prime, product prime, plus v, ym, is equal to minus lambda m w y m. In the second case, we get u y n prime, product prime, plus v y n is equal to minus lambda n w y m. Sorry, y n. Now, looking at these, we notice that if we multiply the first equation through by yn and the second equation through by ym, then these v terms will be the same. They'll be v, ym, yn, v, ym, yn. And the right terms, other than their different eigenvalues, will also be the same. w, ym, yn, w, ym, yn. So, let's subtract... the second equation from the first. Then we will get yn times u ym prime prime from the first equation with the multiplication by yn minus from the second equation ym u yn prime product prime. The v terms will cancel and on the right We'll have a common w y m y n factor, and then let's see minus minus lambda n. That's plus lambda n, and then we've got minus lambda m, and then w y m y n. Now our goal is to show that the integral over this interval of the right hand side is equal to zero. And since the two eigenvalues are different, that factor there can't be zero. So it must mean that the integral of these three functions must be zero. So the integral from x1 to x2 of w of x, ym of x, yn of x, dx must be equal to zero. And that's true for any pair of eigenfunctions, any two solutions we find for different values of the lambda parameter. And we say that ym and yn are orthogonal over the interval x1 to x2 with respect to the weighting, oops, function w of x. 
That's what we're trying to establish. So how will we establish that? We're going to establish that by showing that the left-hand side, the integral of that over this interval is equal to zero. So that's a difference of two terms. So it's going to be a difference of two integrals. The first integral will be the integral from x1 to x2, yn of x, u of x, yn prime of x, prime for that product dx, call that integral i1, and then we'll have that minus integral i2, which will be the integral over the same interval. Now, with the subscripts swapped, ym of x times u of x, yn prime of x, product prime, dx. So we want to show that i1 minus i2 is equal to 0. That will mean the left hand side integral is zero, so the right hand side integral is zero when we establish this orthogonality condition. So here is our integral I1. It is the integral from x1 to x2 yn product of u and y m prime prime of that product dx and we're I'm for compactness I'm dropping the of x notation here so this looks like the uh, or it actually is the integral of a function times the derivative of another function so remember integration by parts which we'll write as the integral of a db is equal to a b minus the integral of b dA, where a and b are some functions. So it looks like we should take a to be equal to yn, then dA would be equal to yn prime dx, um, db will be the remainder of the integrand, that would be u yn prime dx, and b would be the thing that that's the derivative of, I'm sorry, that's prime, the product prime, and that is simply the derivative of u y m prime. All right, so db would be the derivative of this, that's u y m prime, product prime, dx. Okay, so i1 would be equal to a times b, so that's gonna be u, ym prime yn and that's evaluated between x1 and x2 minus the integral over the interval of b dA so that's u ym prime yn prime dx so that's our i1 now I2 is going to be the same, but with the subscripts switched. So this is going to be U Yn prime Ym from x1 to x2 minus the integral from x1 to x2 U Yn prime Ym prime dx. But notice, these final integrals are identical. They just have these two factors swapped. So when we take I1 minus I2, and let me put it down here. So I1 minus I2, well then those two integrals will just cancel out. And that's going to leave us with the integral from a to B of those original expressions in I1 and I2. So that'll be um, 
yn times u y m prime product prime minus that's y n minus y m u y n product uh, prime product prime times dx and that will just be the difference of these two terms here because the integrals will cancel. So that'll be equal to u yn prime yn minus u yn prime ym evaluated from x1 to x2. So now if we can show that this right-hand side here is zero, then this left-hand side will be zero, and that was the result that we wanted to establish. How will we show that the right-hand side is equal to zero? Well, we'll be looking at the boundary conditions. Okay, so let's take a look at this. So we want to show that u ym prime yn minus u ym yn prime evaluated from x1 to x2 is equal to zero. So that's our question mark there. And we know that at both x1 and x2, the functions y satisfy the following boundary conditions. Either u is zero, or the linear combination ay plus by prime is equal to zero, and this is true at x1 and x2. Or a and b are some, some constants. They're, they're a1, b1 at x1, and a2, b2 at, at x2. So let's take a look at this. Let's look, first of all, at the fact that if u is equal to zero, if that's one of the boundary conditions, then obviously both of these terms have a factor of u, so that would be equal to zero at the corresponding uh, endpoint. Right? So if u is equal to zero at x1, then at the endpoint x1, this expression is zero, and likewise if it's equal to zero at x2. What if instead we have ay plus by prime is equal to zero. Well, let's break that down into three cases. What if uh, b is equal to zero? Then ay is equal to zero, and that means that y has to be equal to zero. Well, notice over here, both of these terms have a factor of y, either yn or ym, and they will both satisfy the same boundary conditions. So therefore, both of those terms would be zero at the corresponding endpoint x1 or x2. What if uh, a is equal to zero? Well, then you've got by prime is zero, which means that y prime is equal to zero. So this is the other case. And of course, both of these terms have a y prime, either ym prime or yn prime. So they would be, they would vanish at the corresponding endpoint. In general, if both a and b are non-zero, then we can write that uh, y prime is equal to minus, because a y plus b y prime is equal to zero, y prime is equal to um, minus a over b y. So then in that case, this would look like u well, y m prime would then, we could write that as minus a over b um, y m, because y m prime would be minus a over b y m, and then times y n, and then we'd have minus u y m, and then y n prime would be minus a over b y n, and then these, these two terms are identical, and so that would be equal to zero. So in all possible cases for these homogeneous boundary conditions, at both endpoints, x1 and x2, this expression has to be equal to zero. So what does that establish? That establishes that the original left-hand side of our equation, which was the integral from x1 to x2 of yn u ym prime, product prime 
minus ym u yn prime product prime dx is equal to zero. And that is what we needed to show in order to, to conclude our orthogonality condition that the integral from x1 to x2 w of x ym of x yn of x dx is equal to zero for any two eigenfunctions of the problem. So this orthogonality is just as useful to us as the orthogonality of sines and cosines are in a Fourier series because those allow you to pull out the coefficients by an integration. So one other little piece that we need to put together before we get to that point, however. Let's go back to this term, the Uval equation. U y prime product prime plus lambda w plus v y is equal to zero. So let's call this factor right there g. And in general, it would be g of x, right? And with that, our equation would look like this u of x times y prime, product prime, plus g of x, y, is equal to zero. Now imagine that u and g, instead of being functions, are constants. Then what does this look like? Well, this is a constant times y prime, and the derivative of that, the constant just factors out, you get the constant times y double prime. So we would get u y double prime, and then g is a constant, plus g y is equal to zero. And we can divide through by u. So we get y double prime plus g over u y is equal to zero. And if we call omega is the square root of g over u, then this has the form of y double prime plus omega squared y is equal to zero. And so what is the solution of that equation? Well, it would be a sinusoid, sine or cosine. So let's say, let's use sine uh, of the form sine omega x. Or we could also have the cos. Let's just go with this, the sine. Okay, so it's oscillatory, and the bigger the ratio of g to u is, the bigger the frequency omega is. Here's another thing we can say about a sine, right? If we have sine omega x, what is the period? Well, the period is what value of x do you need to put in to make this equal to 2 pi? So the period, let's call it big lambda, would be 2 pi over omega. And in, if you look at a sine wave, in a half period, uh, any half period, let's say like from here to here, there is one root. So the number of zeros is equal to the number of half periods. So let's say in a, uh, a total interval of L, we just say how many half periods of, are there in L? So that would be L over half a period, lambda over two, and that would be, well, Lambda over 2 would be pi over omega, so that'd be L over pi over omega, or L omega over pi. And that would be the number of zeros of that function. So, Sturm 
came up with Sturm's comparison theorem. And by fairly straightforward arguments, he argued that in the general case where u and g are functions of x, that if u max is the max over the interval of u of x, and g min is the minimum over the interval of g, which is lambda w of x plus v of x, then what you could say is that the number of zeros in general, let's call the n zeros, is greater than or equal to L over pi times, well, we'll make a square root of G over U and you replace that by G min over U max. So there are at least that many zeros of the function of a solution of this in that interval just by comparing it to the case where you set omega is equal to a constant which is the smallest value of the square root of g over u right where you have g min over u max that's the smallest value of this and so he just is able to show that this solution must oscillate at least as many times as the sinusoidal solution to this equation this equation here sorry when omega is equal to the absolute minimum of the square root of g over u. And moreover, if you look at what uh, g is, g is lambda w plus v. And therefore, if, if w is greater than or equal to 0, or, or in general, if we say if, if w of x is greater than 0, on the interval from x1 to x2, then as lambda increases, g is going to increase. And so g min will have to increase. Because whatever it is, if w is not negative here, if it's positive, in fact, in that interval, if I increase lambda, then this is going to increase, and g min has to increase. And that means that the number of zeros has to increase as lambda increases. And therefore, just as you get for sinusoids, where as you, you increase this parameter omega, you get more and more zeros. Here, when you increase this parameter lambda, you get more and more zeros. So all the solutions that you get to the sturm liouville problem, as the eigenvalue lambda gets bigger and bigger, you get more and more zeros, just as you do analogous to what you get with sinusoids. And therefore, Sturm uh, and Liouville were able to argue that for the Sturm Liouville problem, if u of x is positive and w of x is positive over the open interval x1 less than or equal to x less than or equal to x2, we can have u of x is equal to 0 at x1 or x2, but not within the interval. Then the eigenvalues, starting, let's call it lambda 0, is the smallest eigenvalue, then lambda 1 and lambda 2, and etc., that these form an increasing set. Lambda 0 less than lambda 1, less than lambda 2, dot, 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 less than lambda n, less than dot, 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 and they go to infinity. They grow to infinity. And because the number of zeros grows with, with n, and in general, lambda 0 has 0 zeros, lambda 1 has 1 zero, lambda 2 has 2 zeros, and etc., it's possible to show that arbitrarily fine detail can be represented by an infinite sequence of these functions. That is, they form a com what we call a complete set, just like the sines and cosines do. 
And that means that any, I'll put that in quotes, that any well-behaved, it can't be a, any well-behaved function, it can't be a function with an infinite number of discontinuities or anything like that, but any, any function we're interested in can therefore be represented as a superposition of these functions these eigenfunctions of the sturm liouville problem. Sum k equals zero to infinity, a sub k, y sub k of x. And since all of the y sub k functions satisfy the boundary conditions of our original problem, so will y of x. And how do we get the coefficients a sub k? Well, that's where the orthogonality comes in. We get it by saying that then the integral from x1 to x2 of the weighting function times our y of x times, say, any one of those eigenfunctions, say ym of x dx, will be equal to, well, we'll get the uh, sum over all k values, a k, and this will become the integral x1 to x2 w of x by k of x by m of x dx and we know that because these functions are orthogonal with respect to the weighting function w this is equal to zero unless k is equal to m and so that allows us to solve for coefficient a k as the integral from x1 to x2, w of x, y of x, y k of x, dx, over this expression when uh, m is equal to k, which is the integral from x1 to x2, w of x, and that would be then y k squared, dx. All right, so this this is what we call then a generalized Fourier series, and it has all of the nice properties of regular Fourier series. It just might involve more exotic functions. So, for example, uh, in cylindrical coordinates, we will have what we'll call the Fourier Bessel series this will be instead of sines and cosines it'll be in terms of bessel functions and indeed any problem that can be put in the sturm liouville form uh, to that you will get a series of eigenfunctions which could be used to form this generalized fourier series and because they can represent an arbitrary function that's where we're going to get the result that these very specific set of what we call separable functions, functions that can be factored out as a function of one coordinate times a function of another coordinate times a function of the third coordinate, even though that's just a very small subset of all possible solutions of Maxwell's equations, we will be able to use those to form generalized Fourier series in all the coordinates that will be able to represent an arbitrary solution of Maxwell's equations, the completely general solution of Maxwell's equations. A related topic that will be very important to us is the idea of a delta function, or an impulse. Now, you've probably used these quite a bit in linear system theory, uh, probably primarily for functions of time, but we'll be interested in these for functions of space. We'll define delta of x to be the limit this is one definition, as w goes to zero of the function that is one over w when the absolute value of x is less than or equal to w over two and will be zero if the absolute value of x is greater than w over two. And what this looks like is, here's x, x equals zero, so this will be a rectangle and it will go from minus w over 2 to plus w over 2. It'll therefore have a width of w, and it will have a height of 1 over w. 
So its area is w times 1 over w is equal to 1. As w goes to 0, of course, this rectangle shrinks to 0 width and infinite height. And therefore, the integral over all x values, delta x dx, will be equal to 1 because it's the limiting form of a rectangle of area 1. A very useful property of the delta function is that we can use it to represent the sampling of a function. So if we have some function f of x and we multiply it by delta of x minus x0 and integrate that, what are we going to get? Let's visualize this. So here is x0 and the delta function is a very narrow rectangle that's very, very tall. And here's our function f of x. And so what happens right here at x0? Well, f over a vanishingly small width is just equal to f of x0 everywhere in that, uh, that little teeny rectangle. And so we just have the value f of x times the integral of this delta function, which is equal to 1. So this was just be going to be equal to f of x0. So that's in one dimension. And now we can define a delta function in three dimensions, say delta of vector position r. And one way to do that would be just as a product of delta functions in each of the three coordinates. That would be maybe the most straightforward way. Uh, but we'll see there are other possible ways uh, to define it. We could define it in spherical coordinates as as instead of a product of three little rectangles, which makes a, a little um, uh, like a, a little cube, we could make a little sphere of unit area um, in which the radius of the sphere goes to zero, but the amplitude of the function inside the sphere increases to infinity, and do it do it that way. We'll come back to that in in our uh, our. Uh, uh, lectures on spherical coordinates. But so now we would have over all three dimensions of space, the integral of delta of r, d volume would be equal to 1. And d volume could be, of course, dx, dy, dz, or, equiv or uh, the equivalent expressions in uh, other coordinate systems. Now, like other functions, delta functions can be expanded over the eigenfunctions of our sturm liouville problem in a generalized Fourier series. So let's look at one dimension. Suppose we have delta of x minus psi, Greek letter psi there. And we want to represent that as the sum, k equals 0 to infinity, coefficient a sub k times yk of x, where the yk of x is one of the eigenfunctions of our sturm liouville problem. Well, we just use our formula for the coefficients that we derived previously. So ak would be equal to the integral from x1 to x2 of our function, which is delta of x minus psi times the weighting function w of x times our y k of x, and then we have the normalizing condition that we're dividing by the integral from x1 to x2, wx, yk squared of x dx. And now this integral is very easy to do because, as we said, the delta function just pulls out the value of the rest of the integrand when its argument is equal to 0. Well, that would be where x is equal to psi. So this would just be equal to w of psi yk of psi over this integral w of x yk squared of x dx. And so with that, we can represent the, the delta function in terms of the functions that form our generalized Fourier series, and that will be very useful to us.